What a week, David. Let me kick it off with you. What did you do? Were you caught flat footed like most of us in terms of that 2000 point sell off on Thursday? There's kind of um, two answers to that. I feel that we were caught flat-footed the way everyone was in the equity portfolio in the sense that there was absolutely no time to react. And not just this week, but over the last three weeks, it is the unlike 07, 08, and certainly unlike the 2000, 2002 bear market, this was something that came so quickly and so violently. But I felt that we were very prepared in this sense. We're religious asset allocators. We have gains in our fixed income portfolios. We have significant gains in our alternatives portfolio that has softened the equity loss. That's really all asset allocation is supposed to do, soften the effect of volatility. So you can look and say market's down 25%, but look at a portfolio and say down 8, 9, 10%. I don't want to be down 10%, and I don't want our equities down 20s, but that asset allocation story really worked. That's perhaps the most positive thing I could say That's right now. fantastic, and, and, and we want to talk about protecting ourselves in this environment. Yeah. The, the thing about ETFs is you could be selling your ETFs and you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? You're selling companies that maybe, you know, are going to continue growing while maybe others are seeing a slowdown in growth. What did you see this week? Tell us about the sentiment in terms of investors out there and, and what was most important from your standpoint. Panic panic. I mean, uh, like you said, ETFs show a little bit how healthy Wall Street is and the discounts that you saw in some very, very safe fixed income ETFs at the end of the week was just a sign that there was no there were no buyers out there. So there were no buyers, particularly in fixed income. What about equities? Talk about both. Uh, well, equities tend to trade just better, right, because they're all liquid. They trade every day, whereas fixed income, most 90 percent of the bonds in any bond fund or ETF don't trade on a given day. So there's a little less uh, visibility. And most normal investors, even small institutions, aren't, aren't set up to trade bonds uh, on an active basis. So we saw a lot of, I would call it, mispricing or breakage right there. But great opportunity. Great opportunities now, that's for sure, right? Do, yes. do you agree with that? I, I certainly think so. I think the dislocation and equities are easier to quantify. You can look to valuations, look to, as he said, panic. I can't think of a time panic has ever been not viable. The question is just always what the timeline is. Sometimes panic proves to have been viable a week later, sometimes a year later, but buying on panic generally works well. The dislocations of fixed income are all about asset allocation, like I was saying. Where are we going to go right now to get money to put into equities? You're going to get it from fixed income. So ironically, fixed income managers are having to deal with a whole lot of selling, even though they've performed well, yields have collapsed, people are pulling money from there. So it just creates a lot of really interesting activity in capital markets. Yeah, because when you want to sell, you sell what you can sell. You sell where you have liquidity. And that's what we saw this week. Right. Let me ask you about some of these areas where maybe it was an overreaction. I mean, you look at the S&P 500 energy space. This week alone, the S&P energy down 30 um, percent. Of course, oil prices had a huge shock with the Saudi Arabia and Russia fight. Uh, oil down in the 30s. And we were just talking about 45, 50. A lot of these shale companies have bet on $50 a barrel oil. So we will see some bankruptcies there as a result. Give us your take on some of the, some, that sector and others. Well, I like to say we're in a global recession right now. There's no doubt about it. And commodities have been falling since the beginning of the year, since the China slowdown started in January. So they were the worst performing in January, and the slide has continued. That is the sign that that's where the pain is. The epicenter of pain is in the energy markets, and that's also what's trickling over into high yield as well. But to me, that, those are buying signals this week. I feel like oil at 25 or $30 a barrel, that's the lows you saw in 2015. Sure, it may not rally for nine months, but those prices prices are really attractive. So you would buy energy right here? I, I think oil at 25 or 30 is at the lows that you're going to see. And I think, you know, China growth is now going to come back, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, you, you, you have that you know, support. Now, I didn't say it's going to rally immediately. The second area that's a buy to me is high yield, because the high yield debt markets are being hurt because energy bonds, which got hurt a lot in 2015, 2016, are also the epicenter of pain now. But you're seeing high yields back up to where they were in the financial crisis 
If you have some patience, I think that's a, and risk tolerance, that's a good place to be buying. How about you, David? Well, I think on the energy side, we have to remember that the energy sector is about 4% of the S&P 500 now, yeah, good M- point. much to my chagrin. So that 30% drop did not impact broad markets the way it would have even four or five years ago. But I completely agree. The $30 oil is unsustainable. I believe Russia and Saudi are going to blink. And I think they're going to blink hard. Let's take a short break because I want to ask you guys what you think of all of this uh, talk of stimulus. We're going to get a coronavirus package from the Congress, um, the White House working on that as well. And I'm told that in Europe, we will hear on Monday of a coordinated global package. Uh, Angela Merkel talked about that at the press conference. So we'll take a short break. When we come back, did you feel any uh, comfort by the fact that the market comes back Friday morning, rallies more than a thousand points after the 2000 point sell off? Or did you want to see more selling in terms of feeling like, you know, sometimes you really have to see that flush out? What, what, well, what was I, I did not want to see more selling, uh, but, but no, I don't know. Um, I don't know that we didn't see a flush out, but I certainly don't feel comforted in a thousand point rally because it's now the fourth one we've had in two weeks. Mm. None of the other three have been sustained. We just don't know. I, we will hit a bottom. The selling has been so violent, and that's the thing that I can't really explain to my clients how different it is in some past bear markets, that slow drip that lasts a long time where all of a sudden we just took our medicine so quickly. It's very different sensation and it's a very different thing to react to. You look ahead now and say, where are we going economically? And the range of outcomes, I've never seen it so wide. I honestly believe, not being Pollyannish, that you could have a one quarter drop in GDP that with pent up demand coming back produces a massive Q3 uh, economic growth quarter. I also think this could last all the way through the end of the year. Both outcomes are on the table. Mm. We don't know. Therefore, I don't know what an investor should do but be asset allocated, but be diversified and, and try to find the spots along the way. Well, well, the only uh, kind of sort of point I would make in addition to that is the time frame. I really think people will be focusing on the health outcomes over the next month and the peak cases. And so I think if you... At, at, there's no way we'll know within the next month what the outcome is. Maybe we know in a month. So you have a month of uncertainty. The market hates uncertainty. Mm. So I think investors need to be prepared for a lot of volatility between now and then. I just don't see us knowing any better. Cornerstone Macro puts the second quarter real GDP on track for an eight-tenths of a percent decline. So they're looking at contraction in the second quarter. Question is, do we get contraction in the third quarter? They also expect a big rebound in the second half of the year. I don't know if that means third quarter the fourth quarter. Right. Uh, so we're, they're not saying necessarily if we're going to see recession, but obviously second quarter is going to be slow. You say take China out. You got to take China out. But you have to look at China, right? And they're, because their health uh, results are good now. So what is happening? You see a very slow work back to work. It's not all at once. There, I'm not seeing, I'm seeing people get back to work, but not huge pent up economic activity yet. So I don't, I don't see that. I think you have to, you know, take China into account. And if you look at, put, blend that all together, I think we still got uncertainty for the next month. But, but China's economy is a fraction supported by consumers relative to our economy. Our cons- Consumers are not enjoying this lockdown. They want to go back to spending, and they won't until they're ready. The health care results are going to drive everything. We're in total agreement there. But I think we will have pent-up demand to the extent the health headlines allow it. We'll know markets have normalized when there's more bad news or stories of breakout and the markets aren't, don't respond. That's when we started to know the mortgage crisis had turned, that there was kind of ongoing bad news. And the foreclosure numbers kept getting worse, but the markets were going higher. It was just priced in. We were just done going down. Yeah. That number has to come for us here as well. Well, Jan has the right point in terms of we need clarity on the health situation. Absolutely. We're going to speak with the doctor coming up in terms of symptoms and in terms of his, his expectations for a vaccine. But we did get monetary and fiscal policy, right? We did get the Federal Reserve uh, injecting one and a half trillion dollars in the market this week uh, on, on Thursday. We also had an emergency rate cut from the Fed. We know that we had, you know, Australia stimulus package. The ECB is working on a stimulus package that's going to be announced on Monday. The UK cutting interest rates. Your thoughts on, on what is going on in terms of monetary and fiscal responses? Let me address the monetary side because it's something we obsess with at my company. Um, I think monetary 
monetary policy right here is the most ineffectual weapon. Uh, first of all, the 500 billion of repo purchases yesterday lasted about 20 minutes in the market. They told you they're doing a trillion and a half. It'll be done in a week or two. If they were to come out and announce a full round of QE4 with sustained bond buying over the next six to 12 months, I A, think it'd be very distortive, but B, I think the markets would rally on that. We already know they're going to zero bound, Maria. The rates are going to zero. That's they're unbelievable. Gonna, they're going to stay there. So when the economy turns on the healthcare news getting better, you could probably justify 20x in the S&P again. Wow. Because you're going to re-rate around that incredibly low discount rate. They're not going to get off the zero bound for a long time. That's a bigger thing for us to think about six, 12 months out. That's why we had this refinancing boom, because you're borrowing now for free. I mean, that's pretty much what you And it helps business. Businesses a lot too. Yeah, that yeah. too. The, the most important government officials here are actually Andrew Cuomo and Bill de Blasio, who are shutting down New York and making this as short a crisis as it can be. What the central bank can do is provide liquidity, and that's absolutely crucial. It's not something that the person on the street really kind of understands. The financial uh, you know, industry, the balance sheets are strong, the banks are strong, but the money has to flow. Would you look to buy some of the pharmaceutical names that are actually efforting the therapeutics and the vaccine? You know, Gilead working on. It's funny you should ask. We, we've owned Gilead for months now, way before we had ever heard of this treatment and ever heard of coronavirus. Gilead happens to be a big dividend payer and grower, which is our metric for company health. And of course, Gilead now is a ground zero of potentially having that therapeutic. Um, we would not go try to speculate on healthcare companies and treat them as call options on who may have a miracle drug. Gilead's in the game. We already own it. Uh, Merck, Amgen, they're all there. They're going to play an important part private sector doing what it does so well in our country. All right, we will leave it there. David Bonson and Jan Van Eck, great to see you both. Thank you, gentlemen. Please come back soon. Don't go anywhere.